Welcome back. It's time for Silver and Black today, an Odyssey original podcast covering the Las Vegas Raiders. Uh, do us a favor as you come on in and talk Raider football with us, and that is go subscribe to the podcast wherever you get your audio. Make sure you download it. Put on the auto download, actually. That way you don't have to even worry about it. So we thank you. And for our YouTube viewers, thank you so much. Chat is always great and, and on fire as usual. And now I bring in my partner in all of this. That is Mo Moten. He's a senior NFL writer over at Bleacher Report. He is also the Raiders columnist up on sportsnot.com. You can follow him on x.com at M-O-E-M-O-T-O-N. That's Mo Moten. And around these parts, he's known as Midtown Mo. Yes. So get used to that. Also, uh, make sure you follow me, LV Gully. You can also catch my work up on sportsnot.com. Well, Mo, uh, we're, we're moved a few days now from the Raiders win. It still doesn't feel like the Raiders won. And you know what? Even Devontae Adams at the Wednesday press conference said, hey, yeah, it's great, but we can't keep eking by and winning. We need to actually come out and convincingly win. And that's how the fans feel. So it, it, you know, Devontae Adams is going to always speak the truth. He's a great leader, and he's at that point in his career where he can say what he wants to within reason, and and that's what he did. Yeah, absolutely. He's always a candid speaker at the microphone or at the podium. So whatever comes out of his mouth, you know he absolutely means it, whether he's talking to an interviewer or – you know, talking to the locals. So he's and he's right. He captured the uh, the feeling of the fanness, so to speak, because after that game, you you'd be surprised that the Raiders won the game the way some people were just not happy. Like the main topic, because I went live right after. And the main topic was Josh Patino still sucks. It wasn't the Raiders get a W. They break a three game losing streak. It was, man, Josh Patino sucks. You need, you need to get rid of him somehow. And I think that's why. I don't want to say fans wanted the Raiders to lose, mm-hmm. but I think that's why the, the win comes kind of like as a wet blanket because it, it only kind of strengthens Josh McDaniel's job security in the sense that he'll probably be back for 2024. Well, and, and that's one of the things that I find interesting. And this is not just Raider Nation. This is fan bases in general when things are not going well. They, they want they want it to go well, and so they want somebody be, to be held accountable for their bad feelings about how the team is doing. So the coach makes sense. And, I, you know, I have had people say, why don't you call for him to be fired? I said, because I don't call for people to fire. I'm going to report on how I don't think he's doing a good job, but it's not my job to call on him to be fired. Also, I don't think he's going to be fired. You and I talked about this on the Mailbag Show on Wednesday and, and talked about it on the post game show. Unless something crazy happens and we go back to what we've been saying for two months now, which is unless the locker room is a complete disaster and the owner sees that he cannot lead them in any direction whatsoever, I just don't think he's going to get fired. So I, I, I know fans want it to happen. We all want things to happen in life. I just don't think it is, especially at this point, the Raiders, as you said so perfectly in your column on Sports Not uh, last week, was the the Raiders are this week actually I'm losing track the, the Raiders are coming up on this big three game stretch right it's really a four game stretch but three of them very very favorable games to them because they're playing three as we enter today one and four teams then you throw the Lions who are four and one in the middle of that but but overall um, there's still time to turn it around actually there's a lot of time to turn it around we're only what a quarter into the season yeah. so I mean. About a quarter, a little more than a quarter way to the season. But I don't think fans want to hear that after what they've watched for the first five weeks from the offense because you're right. expecting more out of the offense. So you're, you're just thinking about, okay, when, when is the hammer going to drop where we get blown <laughs> out because we can't score more than 18 points in a football game? So I think that's what fans are kind of waiting for, that embarrassing football game that kind of sums up how they felt about the offense and Josh McDaniels all along. But hopefully they, they're able to get by with, a bit of a win streak. I, I said this before. I, I think the Raiders have a chance to, when you look up, they'll be four and three, you know, considering what the Patriots look like right now. Uh, I know the bears have showed some life with Justin Fields throwing eight TDs and just one interception his last two games. He's starting to look like the Justin Fields I thought he would be, but uh, the Raiders have an opportunity to turn things the right way, get on the right track and build some momentum. But with that, there's gotta be a lot more scoring. I need to see 24, 27 points at some point in the very near future. I had somebody tell me online when I was talking about uh, or or had had posted about the the 20-point issue, 
well, they missed two field goals. They should have had 24. Yeah. And I should have been six feet three. I mean, it doesn't matter. <laughs> like, it doesn't matter. If it didn't happen, it doesn't matter. Like, that's the point. They're not scoring the points. If you miss field goals, I know Carlson's a very good kicker and usually very reliable. And yes, both were over 50 yards, but it doesn't matter. So I think, I, to your point, the Raiders could very easily get to four wins, as you suggest, uh, in their first seven. But again, it all depends on how things go. It all depends on what we see from a progression standpoint. Can the offense, I'm assuming if they go to four and three, they're going to have to score more than 20 points once. Who knows? Maybe. Uh, but also, you, you want to see the team, you want to see Josh Jacobs finally get going. And, you know, looking back on it, I think on game night, we're like, oh, yeah, Josh Jacobs did better. But it's really not that great. He's still not he's still not been able to do that. Now, is there a problem with the line? Yes. And we'll get into the offense in segment number two. Mo, I want to talk at the top a real big positive for this team coming out of the week. And slowly, I'm not ready to, you know, crown anybody here. But the defense is making some progress. We've seen it the last two games. They've only given up, given up one touchdown in the last six quarters. If you go back to the Charger game and include the win over Green Bay, we're starting to see some of these players, I think, settle into the Patrick Graham defense, settle into one another. Obviously, Robert Spillane had the two interceptions, uh, and, and you had Max Crosby, who, by the way, named yesterday the AFC Defensive Player of the Week, and it was well-deserved, and he did it on a national stage, which helps, by the way. So you have that, and you're starting to see even Tyree Wilson in his in his limited action starting to get a little better. We've seen some film of him get off the ball better and actually make some nice moves. So he's starting to maybe gain a little confidence. And then this has been without two of your top defensive backs, the cornerbacks, Nate Hobbs, obviously out and, and so they've done it in, in a banged-up state. What are you seeing from this defense that you really like and that you say, hey, you know what? Whatever you think of Patrick Graham, maybe those position coaches, whoever, they're starting to at least progress to a point where you're like, hey, I, I can see it in front of me, and it's meaningful. Before I get into it, I want to say that there are always going to be busted coverages. There are always going to be plays always. where guys look confused. Uh, even the better defenses have those moments, so I know a lot people say what about Marcus Epps and Mike Robertson leaving Christian Watson open and Marcus Pierce having to horse collar him to save a touchdown and I would say that that happens a lot if you watch a lot of football games but it's happening a lot fewer times with the Raiders now in their defense so maybe guys are just starting to click and communicate a lot better maybe there's a simplified approach I remember Vic Tafer mentioned that Patrick Graham was going to maybe kind of pare things down so that guys can be better at reacting or, or better, better at playing instead of reacting so you're just playing football and not having to think about a million things. And, you know, should I, should I, you know, fill the gap here or do I pass the guy off here or there? So I think guys are just playing football. And I think it's leading to plays being made. Uh, you look at that Amik Robertson interception to seal the game. That was all Amik Robertson. It had nothing to do with scheme. That's just Amik Robertson wanted that football. And he, he felt like, look, I either, I intercept this football. This guy catches it, scores a touchdown and we lose. So Amik just wanted it that much more. One thing I will say about scheme and Patrick Graham is I like what he's doing with Max Crosby. If you notice, Max Crosby mm -hmm. isn't just an edge rusher. He's rushing even in the middle. He's shooting the middle gaps, the interior gaps. And that's where you usually have a defensive tackle, your three tech attack the line of scrimmage. But because the Rays don't have consistent pass rush in the interior, Max Crosby has to fill in there. And that's why right now he's basically Superman at the defensive line. He's on the edge. He's shooting <laughs> interior gaps. He's getting pressures. You know, he's getting in the quarterback's face. So he he deserves any award he gets at this point. But I like the fact that Patrick Graham is moving him around the defensive line to kind of give him an advantage over some of the slower offensive linemen up front. Yes, my my GameCast partner for the, the PSF app, of course, Big Corey, he, he posted that uh, on Wednesday. He said, you know what, whatever position it is that they're that they've now created for Max Crosby. He's an animal, and he is, because you're right. He, they are moving him around so effectively, and that's obviously out of necessity, correct, Mo? I mean, that's not where you'd like to be, but maybe, just maybe, they have stumbled upon something that you can do with somebody like Max Crosby, and then just put him wherever you want and, and keep the defense guessing, because as they assign people to Max Crosby preparing for a game, suddenly he's no on that side, and suddenly he's on the inside, and suddenly he's on the outside. You don't know what the hell to do. And that's a big advantage. It worked perfectly against Green Bay. They didn't know what was going on. Right. And I think, as you said, it's it's out of necessity, but I think it's pretty good that Patrick Graham was unable to 
able to unlock that in Max Crosby because we didn't see a lot of that with the previous regimes that you can actually use him as kind of a, a chess piece on the defensive line. Usually when you hear about a defensive chess piece, you usually hear about it in the secondary, a guy who can play safety, slot cornerback, and cornerback. Well, Max Crosby is the chess piece that you have at the front of the board where you can line him up over a guard, a tackle. He can shade the guard. He can shade the center. He can, he can stunt. He can twist. So a lot of things you could do with a Max Crosby, and that's why I strongly believe he should get more defensive player of the year votes if the Raiders can, you know, win more games, win more than six, seven games this year. Yeah, and if he continue to, continues to do it on the national stage. So the Raiders have a, a Monday night game against uh, Detroit, right? So they'll be on Monday night football again. I think they have two more after that as well. So so it, it, that matters. You look at Mo, an, a, a unit we talked about a lot during the offseason. We've talked about it for years, but we really focused in on the linebackers, right? We, we You talked about Patrick Queen and all that stuff, trying to get better at that position. Robert Spillane is limited in what he can do in his skill set, uh, but he has been playing really, really well. We saw him, obviously, against the Packers do well. We've seen Divine Diablo at times, again, a young player, developing player, do do some pretty nice things too. What do you see in that linebacking? I think they've gotten a lot better. They've more active and they seem to be catching on a little more and 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 they're able to perhaps close the gap a little bit up front uh when when they do engage on defense. And to me, that's that's a plus, right? Cuz we didn't expect much from that unit, but but overall, as the games have gone on, I think they've gotten better as well. Yeah, as I said, Previously, it's just playing football instead of reacting. So when that tip ball happened with Marcus Peters, Robert Spillane gets that interception. It's not all Marcus Peters. It's it's, Pat, it's uh, Robert Spillane, excuse me, being aware of where he is in the football field and being aware of where the ball is to get his hands up and get the interception. The other interception for Robert Spillane, right place at the right time. Again, he's a linebacker. He's not he's not trained to catch footballs, but he was aware of where the football was grabs an interception and gives the Raiders another possession. So, again, I don't think it's just all – it's scheme. It's more of players just making plays. Yeah. No, absolutely. And then we talked about the the state of the defensive backfield. Um, Trayvon Morig has, Merrick has come along better. Like, beginning of the season, I was still down on him. I thought he performed pretty poorly. But as the time has gone on, too, he made some nice plays against Green Bay and even going back to the L.A. game against the Chargers – uh, and and so you're starting to see that you see apps again played well overall yes they have work to do and they're missing two of their own uh, but this unit now they weren't facing Justin Herbert the, again they were facing this time Jordan Love who did not have a good game but part of that was because how they played and of course you have Meek Robertson who just goes wherever you need him he's like the the utility man if you need him here or need him there he's there for you and he's able to make plays um, this unit should only get stronger as they get healthy. It should only get stronger as they get healthy. They have, you know, depth in the slot. I think Tyler Hall has been a pretty good yes. slot defender with Nate Hobbs not playing. I I was on this show and I said I felt like Tyler Hall should have made the uh, the 50 man roster. He didn't, but when they call on him from the practice squad, he's ready to play and he's ready to make plays out there in the secondary. So shout out to him. But I, I think Meek Robertson deserves all the praise he gets because. You know, you write him off. You think he's done. You think he's too small. He's not this. He's not that. He knows how to get after the football, though. Because like I said, on that, on that final play, he just wanted it more than that Packers wide receiver. And he wins the game for the Raiders, essentially sealing it, with that interception. So it kind of reminded me of when he had that uh, that play against the Arizona Cardinals. If you remember, he was on our show. He talked about that, that yeah. turnover being the moment where it kind of clicked for him. I wouldn't be surprised if he's thinking of that interception, that game sealing interception, as okay, this is my step forward. Now I can kind of relax and people know who I am. I was on a national stage. I'm on Monday Night Football and I get the game winning play. So now people know, okay, that Amik Robertson that we saw at Louisiana Tech that was getting all those interceptions is the same Amik Robertson you see in a Raiders uniform right now. Yeah, absolutely. Good stuff. Uh, and I think that I think that in many ways, because the result it's a results based business. So you have to go with what happens. And the defense has struggled mightily early in the season. But perhaps we were just a little bit impatient with them, with the pieces, with what's going on. You know, sometimes it does. It just takes – I'm not saying that it's optimal, but sometimes units, when they've changed around, they add new pieces to it, you you see them kind of catch on week by week and they start to get better. So hopefully that's what's happened. I think 
you know, some people would say, well, they got better because they played a bad team. Well, it doesn't matter. You play who you line up against, but but the soundness of the fundamentals and making plays when you're supposed to, it doesn't matter who you're playing. That's what you have to do. It's That's on you and on the team, and they were able to do that against Green Bay. So good stuff, and, and you know, we wanted to start with that because I think it was a really big positive coming out of that win. All right, we are going to take our first break. When we come back, we're going to get into a conversation heating up a little bit, uh, and and some people, it, there's an irony there, which I will talk to, and that is talking about the offense, talking about Jimmy Garoppolo and uh, where he stands and the concerns there with his play thus far into the 2023 season. Three season, excuse me. You're with Mo and Scott. This is Silver and Black today. Don't go back. Don't go back anywhere. Stay here. Thank you. Welcome back. Silver and Black today. This is Scott Branson along with Mo Moten. We're talking Raiders football with you. Yes, just only you. It's a party of three, and we're talking directly to you. Yes. No, we're talking to everybody out there. Make sure you subscribe to the podcast, and also a hello to everybody on YouTube. Okay, Mo, let's jump into this. Uh, I wrote a piece on Sports Not about Jimmy Garoppolo where I said it's not going well, and the bet that Josh McDaniels and Dave Ziegler made on the quarterback has been a bust so far. And I had some folks come. I, I'm surprised by some of the pushback. I, I, I didn't write it for a reaction or a negative reaction from people. It was meant to explore the numbers. And if you look at Jimmy Garoppolo, what he's done, he's been turning the ball over. It's the biggest issue. Uh, also, the stats you've seen about throws outside the numbers and, and efficiency have, are very low for Jimmy Garoppolo. But out of all the quarterbacks in the NFL, he's 5% of his passes are interceptions. He's leading the league with seven. Okay, he's got six touchdowns. That is not a good thing. He was brought in to be the bridge veteran so that a rookie didn't have to come in right away or some other quarterback and turn the ball over, right? It's protecting the ball. I got pushback, man. I got put, well, you're being too hard on him. Why are you being so hard on him? Now, again, I ended the piece by saying it's early. He could turn it around, but boy, it's just not going well right now. And I found it ironic because... A year ago, we had another quarterback in Las Vegas, and when he was doing poorly, people were pretty harsh, <laughs> right? And so uh, by exploring this, and now we're starting to see other media write about this um, over the next couple of days, uh, the Jimmy Garoppolo, it, it, it's just not working, and I don't think that it can, Mo. I mean, I'm glad, I'm glad to be wrong, but I just don't see anything changing because he's a nine-year veteran. And he's got all those weapons, and it doesn't seem to be clicking for him. Well, I'll just say I think people just had Derek Carr fatigue, and that's why you you know people were just ready to move on from Derek Carr. Yeah. So it was, a, it was a kind of it was a different situation there. But with Jimmy Garoppolo, I think people are seeing what he is outside of San Francisco, outside of the San Francisco 49 system. And I think this is what you would probably get with any other team, simply because quarterbacks. All quarterbacks are reliant on their supporting cast. You need tight, you need a uh, pass catching wide receivers, you need tight ends, you need blocking, a run game. But I think Jimmy Garoppolo, more than a lot of other quarterbacks in this league, is more dependent on his supporting cast. I how many times this past summer did I say needs a run game, needs a strong defense? Because that's what he had for the most part part in San Francisco. If you want to see the Jimmy Garoppolo that was a winner in San Francisco, you have to build a similar system to what he had in San Francisco. And while the defense for the Raiders is playing pretty well, and that's how they won that Packers game, the run game hasn't gotten going yet. You talked about Josh Jacobs putting up more yards on the ground against the Packers, but still not the Josh Jacobs we saw last year, the same player who won the 2022 Russian title. And other than Devontae Adams, Jacoby Myers, what other playmakers have made splashy plays michael mayer finally got on the board with a multiple catch game he had two catches in the first half and then jimmy garoppolo missed him when he was wide open but they haven't utilized uh trey tucker hunter renfro has been underutilized austin hooper who knows where he is and it's just it's not the same in san francisco i didn't expect it to be the same in san francisco but i think i, I said this to adrian who's our correspondent that i think people people had too high of expectations for Jimmy G based on mm. what he did in San Francisco. I think the expectations were way up here when they should have been kind of down here, because in my, in my opinion, if I were doing a quarterback rankings, Jimmy G is in the mid to low twenties. Yeah. Yeah. And I think you look at this too, and you see, you're seeing some of the conversation come out about, well, you know, because the line's not doing well and it's not the offensive line. We'll save that for a different show, but, 
because the offensive line's not doing well, that limits the play calling and that limits and it's 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 I understand what people are asserting, but the the decisions that Jimmy Garoppolo is making are not good decisions. The dis- and he admits this after every and I, I mentioned it in my piece with his quote, which is yeah, I with the I, the interception this past weekend or on Monday night was yeah, I, I saw him, I threw behind him. It's not a throw I should make. Yeah, it was a bad decision. Okay. Well, you're a nine year vet though. And you're making a bad decision that resulted in seven points. And so this is what he said after. And I don't expect him to get up there and say, yeah, I suck or yeah, I do this. I mean, of course, he's going to say what he means. But to me, you can't afford this with a team that is where it is. You are in a razor thin area of being a team that's around 500 ish, right, with some of the talent and the money they spend on offense and a defense they're still rebuilding. But what you're getting now is a guy that is not performing, to your point, like he did in a different system surrounded by a lot more talent. I think if the Raiders could just get their run game going, you'll see a different Jimmy G because then people would have to either stack the box or just have more respect for the run game. Right now, the Raiders, you know, they're not they're not even close to that four yards per carry average with their run game. So if, you, if you're not knocking off four yards per carry, you can say, hey, we don't need to stuff the box with Josh Jacobs. And even when they do unexpected rundowns, what is Jimmy Garoppolo going to do with the one-on-one situations on the outside? He's been off target a lot of times where yeah. it's it's just bad ball placement. And people want to blame the offensive line. I had a couple of – I put up a couple of throws on my Bleach Report live after the, after the Steelers game, I believe it was, where Jimmy Garoppolo, even when the pressure wasn't around him, even when defenders weren't breathing down his neck, he was still – throwing some errant passes downfield. So I'm not giving him a pass and saying because the offensive line hasn't played well, it's affecting Jimmy G and all of his throws. Has it affected some of his throws and some of his play? Yes. But if you look at some of those plays, he's off target even when there's no pressure around him. I agree. And and in fact, I mean, I looked, I was watching the the game, uh, Monday night's game, and I'm looking at it and there were plenty of times. I what I'm what I'm concerned with and what I wrote about as well is he's not seeing people he's not seeing some of these routes and it's he's not going through his progressions it seems as though he's not comfortable and so he he often will make a quick snap decision which might not be the best one and we saw that with Derek Carr last year by the way so why are these quarterbacks unable to be comfortable is it them is it the system I mean these are some questions you should we should ask again I'm not I'm not in any way excusing Jimmy Garoppolo for the mistakes he makes on his own but it's sort of interesting, don't you think, that I mean, Derek Carr, to me, last year had that just kind of deer-in-the-headlights look for most of the year, and I see it again with Jimmy Garoppolo. I think part of it is maybe he doesn't trust his offensive line. That I think that's what some fans are saying. Especially when saying, injured that he, a lot, right? Because, because he doesn't trust his offensive line, it's affecting his play where he can't stand – confidently in the pocket because he doesn't look that confident in the pocket right now mm-hmm. if you look at his dropbacks at the top of his dropbacks and when he's standing there when there's no pressure on him and he's scanning the field he looks kind of jittery and that's and i think you know that could be affecting his ball placement his throws downfield but you know you have to talk to your head coach talk to your play caller hey i don't trust the offensive line we need to do something else with the pass protection because if that doesn't get fixed you're not going to score more than 18 points and you're mm-hmm. going to start losing football games and it's going to start to go downhill and people are going to ask for Josh McDaniels to be fired, Tate Ziggler to be fired, Jimmy Garoppolo to be replaced. And you're going to have players like Devontae Adams that are not happy because they're not getting the ball. Uh, now, you have a rookie tight end, so he's not going to complain like a veteran. You know, if Darren Waller was still there, someone like that who who was out there and not getting passes to thrown to them, they might be more vocal. We saw Devontae Adams do it a couple days ago, or after the game, I should say, when he said, hey, I'm always double covered, but you still need to find me, right? It's, you need to throw into tight coverage sometimes. I'm going to go get it. Don't worry about it. You throw it my way, I'll get it. And that's not happening either. So I think there is something to what you say, which is not being comfortable in that pocket, but also realizing the limitations that this quarterback has. And we talked about those, and you mentioned them all summer, uh, so much so that I was hearing them in my dreams. Um, and, and so we're seeing that come to fruition. So I think a lot of people aren't really surprised by it, but at the same time, uh, because it's been so, um, I think under, under the gun here with the way the offensive line is played and the way this team has started, it's, it's just been, I think more aware and people have been more aware of it. Yeah, but 
I'm not giving again. I'm not giving Jimmy G a pass here because I, you can rewind the tape. I didn't want the Rays to sign him in the first place because I feel like he was midi G. I, I coined that <laughs> phrase by the way. People are now. I'm starting to see it on X. People are you? using midi. Yes, I'm starting to see people use midi G on Twitter X, and I, I need to say you people need to give me credit for that because I started that over here on Silver and Black today. But not in all seriousness. I put it out there in the post game with you and Murph after the Packers game. If Jimmy Garoppolo continues to turn the ball over, you gotta have to sit him down. Play the rookie. I'm fine. I'd be fine with that. Find out what you have in Aiden O'Connell because Jimmy Garoppolo, at that point, if you're turning the ball over nearly twice a game, you're no better than a rookie who's learning the pro the pro game because that's what you preach to a rookie. Hey, don't put us in bad situations. Don't turn the ball over, and that's exactly what your veteran is doing right now. Yeah. And, and I go back to what I was what I was talking to you about earlier, which which is this rate at which he's throwing interceptions. Right. So you have numbers, you know, uh, Josh Dubow from AP. Somebody was talking about it, about it being upset, acceptable. And he said, well, Derek Carr threw seven interceptions or what it was over for the last four games. And it's like, yeah, but it's it's different. They come in bunches and you understand that. But the rate at which he's throwing in four games over the start of of his time in Las Vegas is very concerning. And I'm I'm with you, Mo. I, I don't. He does not. He does not get a pass on it. This is professional football. You have to perform. If you're unable to perform, especially they're not asking you to throw Josh Allen yards. They're just asking you to take care of the football and move the offense. It's very methodical in this system. That's all they're asking you to do. They're not asking you to do too much. And he's not able to do the minimum. And that's why people should be very concerned about where he's at. Absolutely. And I, I think I tweeted this during the offseason that I told Raider fans not to expect Jimmy G to go bombs away on a lot of these passes because he doesn't have that deep ball arm. Expect to, you know, if at his best, he's going to be efficient. And we haven't even gotten that yet from him. So if they could just kind of just not I wouldn't say throw away the long ball because you need to utilize that with Devontae Adams and Trey Tucker was mentioning when he comes along. But simplify it to him, simplify it for him where he's not just throwing checkdowns all day, but help him gain some confidence, get some easy completions early in the game so that he could take shots later in the game. Mo Mo, what we're going into week six now. Um and and who knows what happened. You you would imagine I, I we're gonna get to the game and, and picking who wins in the next segment. But what has to happen? I mean, at what point, if, if the Raider, if he's ineffective, even when you win, though, like he, he was he was not effective per se. He didn't do a ton to lose the game, but he also didn't really help a ton to win the game against Green Bay. At what point do you say, um, we're going to sit you and we're going to play the rookie? I, I, I think it has to be a losing streak, right? It can't be just uneven performances over a 500 record. You win two, you lose two. Now, I've watched a lot of 49er games, and I've seen situations where Kyle Shanahan actually sat Jimmy Garoppolo in the middle of the game and said, we're bringing in our backup. And this is before the game got way out of hand. I believe there was one game where Jimmy G threw back-to-back -back interceptions on a, on, in a game, and then he was just sat. I think it was against the Dolphins hmm. a few years ago. Not last year, because I think that was, that was the game he was injured. But I've Vaguely, I vaguely remember Kyle Shanahan benching Jimmy Garoppolo during a game because he was ruining it for that team. And I think Josh McDaniels has to have the same mentality. Now, the problem with that is if you bench Jimmy G in the middle of the game, you're bringing in Brian Hoyer because Brian Hoyer continues to be QB2 over Aiden O'Connell. Now, if there's a possibility that you could bench Jimmy Garoppolo because he's turned the ball over at a high rate, I would rather have Aiden O'Connell's QB2 and say, hey, Aiden O'Connell, Jimmy, if Jimmy turns the ball over, Aiden O'Connell, you're going in, we're going to give you more reps during practice to prepare for that situation. Hopefully it doesn't, but be ready if it does. Yeah. Yeah. Good point. All right. Well, there you go. Tell us what you guys think in the comments. If you're on YouTube or if you're listening to the audio version, just tweet at us, X at us. We still haven't figured out how to say that, uh, but you can find Mo at M O E M O T O N. That's Mo Moten. I am at LV Gully. All right. We're going to take our final break. When we come back, we will, we will summon from the ethos Mostradamus, and we will ask him what's going to happen on Sunday against the hoodie. We're coming back here on Silver and Black today. Don't go anywhere. Welcome back, home stretch, Silver and Black today. Hope you guys are all doing well. Whether you're listening to us on audio via the podcast, which is an Odyssey original podcast, 
or on The Bet on the radio in Las Vegas on Saturday night. Welcome to you as well. And for the folks on YouTube, hey, good to see you. Hope you're having fun uh, chatting with one another and telling each other like 100 times over to fire Josh McGinnis because that's probably what's happening in the chat. But anyway, we're back. It is Momo and Skockle Branson. And we are going to talk about the game on Sunday. We talked about, and you talked about in your column, Mo, about this 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 next stretch of games gives the Raiders really their 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 if you want to say soft, I hate to use that word, the softest part of their schedule, the most advantageous part of their schedule as things are sitting today. Three one and four teams and a four and one team sandwiched kind of towards the end of that. And you look what's happening here. Um, this opportunity on Sunday to face the Patriots again, a team they beat at home last year only because of the Chandler Jones miracle play. This team and Bill Belichick are in the throes of the worst set of games that this coach has seen there and that this team has seen in a very, very, very long time. Um, what do you see when you see this Patriots team and what is what does it say to you about the Raiders' chances, especially maybe to get their offense in gear and maybe to continue to build the momentum on defense? Believe it or not, I see a lot of similarities between the Patriots and the Raiders' offenses right now. The Patriots are second in the league in turnovers with 11. The Raiders are tied for third with 10. So if I had to guess, we're if things continue the way they're going for both teams, specifically on offense, we're going to get a sloppy football game where – the team that turns the ball over fewer times is probably going to win the game with a low score, 2016, something like that. Now, me personally, I have a Bleacher Report column out today. Actually, yes, out today. And I actually picked the Raiders to win this football game 20 to 16. That's why I put the number out there. 20. As 20 to 16. <laughs> so they get their 20 points. They score two touchdowns. They kick two field goals. Daniel Carlson is back on track. And the Raiders win and still fans are still railing. Only 20 points? How can we only get 20 points against the terrible Patriots? <laughs> I will say Bill Belichick is a pretty good defensive head coach. Now his offense isn't doing him any favors right now, but you have to respect that D Bill Belichick, while his, his drafting is very suspect, the players that he does get on the defensive side of the ball play up to their highest potential usually. So this isn't, even though the Patriots are pretty poor right now, this isn't going to be a cakewalk game for the Raiders. So as you said, I hate to use the word soft or easy when I describe any part of the schedule, but I will say it's favorable because the Patriots are just as sloppy as the Raiders when it comes to turning the ball over with their offense. Well, you, okay. So that's good. Does this, what does this game mean for Jimmy Garoppolo's future in Las Vegas? Knowing that this Patriots team, and look, it's the NFL. Every game is tough. Don't get me wrong. Even when teams are bad, it's still professional football for the most part. But Jimmy Garoppolo, second home game in a row, doesn't perform great in the first game. Second game you're playing against the reeling Patriots. If he turns the ball over a ton or isn't effective again, um, what, is that, what does that say for him? And, and what could possibly happen if it goes that way? I don't Actually, I don't think it says much for him within – the Raiders organization because I don't see them benching him long term for a rookie quarterback because you got to remember it was Josh McDaniels who handpicked this guy. He's going to mm -hmm. give him a long leash. And in, unless Jimmy Garoppolo is absolutely awful, let's say a four interception game or a three interception game with no touchdowns, then I could see, you know, his tenure as a starting quarterback being in trouble. But let's just remember that they paid him a decent sum of money. And again, he was handpicked by Josh McDaniels. So Josh McDaniels is going to try to make this work the best of his ability. But the fans, of course, would be calling for his job. They're calling for it. Some fans are calling for it right now. Absolutely. Absolutely. I'm going to, I'm going to pick the Raiders too. The first time I think I've done it since week one. And, uh, but I'm going to give them 24 points. Mo. I think, I think they're going to come out. I think this is the game that Josh Jacobs gets on track. I thought that with the Packers, I was wrong, but I do. It's like I, we said I, that for some for three reason, weeks. Yes, probably. And because uh, I believe I believe in you, Josh. <laughs> but but I, I also think there's going to be people out there who say, well, you're, you're just hammering Jimmy Garoppolo and you say they're going to score 24 points. Yeah, because I think I think the Patriots are that bad. But I also think that um, that that this might be the perfect opportunity for them to get it on track. If they don't get it on track, if they lose this game at home to the Patriots. Things are going to get ugly. I really do believe that um, because even though they're in this nice stretch, if you can't do that, if you can't beat them at home, and they barely did last year, they shouldn't have beat them at home last year if it wasn't for Jacoby Myers, and now he's a Raider. So we'll see all those stories coming up uh, this week 
as well. But to me, that's that's where they're going to be. But my question now is, just to jump out of it a little bit, is the hoodie done? Do you think, I mean, all this conversation now is starting to build, and I'm going on later today with the guys uh, with the New England podcast, Six Rings and Football Things, and um, I just wonder, I wonder because, you know, you've always looked at him as untouchable, his relationship with Robert Kraft, but also Robert Kraft has his own ego. And if his team has looked as poor as it has over the last several weeks, you start to maybe wonder, is it time to say goodbye? Uh, a lot of people want to assert it's because Tom Brady's not there and it was all Tom Brady and wasn't Bill Belichick. I don't believe that, but there, there comes an end to everything, Mo. Nothing is forever. I wrote a column up on Bleacher Report Sunday night, and I said the time the clock has started ticking on Bill Belichick's time in New England. I, I think if New England, you know, wins five or six games or they have a top ten pick, I, I think they turn it over and they get a new head coach in there. Because as I briefly mentioned, look at the Patriots draft history. Oof. They can't they they don't know how to draft wide receivers at all. Yeah. And I can't I can't remember the last wide receiver that the Patriots have drafted that has been a consistent contributor anywhere in the league, not alone, not just the Patriots, but anywhere else. So there's a draft issue. And Bill Belichick is the de facto GM over there. I know he had Dave Ziegler and other guys, Nick Casario, over there helping him out. But the buck stops at his desk. He's making all the decisions there or most of the decisions there. So if the Patriots are a poor drafting team, that starts and stops with Bill Belichick. And if you want to better draft the team, you're going to have to move on from him. Yes, absolutely. What about, uh, I wanted to close out a little bit here on the show talking about, and I know you wrote about this, um, uh, possibilities for trades in the NFL, especially with the Raiders. Uh, the trade deadline's at the end of the month, so we still got a few weeks left. So uh, at what point, at what record do you have to sit, Mr. Moten, if you're Dave Ziegler and you start thinking about trading? Now, we know, at least by reports, or at least assumed, they're trying to move Hunter Renfro, which is not going well because they don't highlight him and and they're going to probably have to give up too much to get rid of him and his $14 million, which is, to me, that's GM malpractice, by the way. And um, is there anything out there? I mean, the Raiders, if, if they win, if they if they sit at four and three, do they have to think about going out and getting, without a doubt, a defensive end and say, hey, we're at four games. Yeah, we're, we're about halfway there in the season or a little less than that, uh, do we make a run at it? Or do we say, you know what? This team is developing. We're not going anywhere and we're not going to trade any of our draft capital. Well, reading the tea leaves from Diana receives report over, with, over at the athletic, the Raiders have already made calls for a veteran pass rusher. So I expect them to bring in a veteran pass rusher, regardless of what their record is. Cause you got to remember they let go of Chandler Jones and they expect him to be there for the remainder of the season. And hopefully next season. Now that's that's completely done. So they're going to, in my opinion, they're going to bring in another veteran at some point, whether it's this week, next week, or the following week. But the Raiders are 2-5 and five after that Lions game on Monday Night Football and the trade deadlines the next day on Halloween. You're sitting at 2-5 and five with three consecutive losses, two of them to bad football teams. Then there there might be other guys on the trade block. And I would say of, of all the, of the big-name guys, I would say – possibly Josh Jacobs, especially if the run game doesn't pick up by that time, you're probably not going to pay Josh Jacobs next offseason. So why not trade him and get draft capital for him right now? Yeah, it's a good point. And I think that, and, and you don't want the Raiders to be in that position. Obviously, if you're a fan and, and, and us covering them, we don't want to be in that position either because it's not a, not a good time, but yeah, the, the, the buying though, it has to be someone, if they go get a veteran defensive end, Mo, it's got to be somebody that's going to stick around for a while. So somebody who's got a deal, who's who's an A-level player, who's going to be around, right? You, you're not going to go out and give up a player or a player in capital for a guy you're renting in a season. You're probably not going to make the playoffs anyway. It, it all depends how the Raiders feel about their roster at the time of the trade. So let's say the Raiders win their next two games, and all of a sudden now they're 4-3. and three. They may take a rental guy because they say, well, who knows what could happen for the rest of the season? We're sitting here at four and three with the winning record. We built some momentum. We finally scored more than 18 points. The defense is playing well. We've got a shot. Let's not forget that there's an extra playoff team in each conference now. There's seven playoff teams. So that team that usually wouldn't make the playoffs at eight, nine, nine, and eight now is in. 
And I remember, I'll go back to this again. I remember in 2021 when the Raiders were slumping late in the season and it was the COVID year and I was putting out Raider playoff scenarios and people were like, Mo, you're wasting these time with these stupid playoff scenarios. The Raiders are not going to make the playoffs. And they made the playoffs. Now they lost against the Cincinnati Bengals and they had some help from playing backup quarterbacks, but they won the football game. So my point to that is you just never know what's going to happen, especially when you have a winning record in the middle of the season. You're right. I mean, a 17 week season, it's, it's a really long time and you know, we're entering week six, so we're not even halfway there yet. And you're right. Things can change. Injuries can happen as we saw in Minnesota this week, right? Injuries in, in Miami. Now Miami happens to be loaded at running back. So Devon H ain't going out. Um, it hurts them clearly. And it's, it sucks for the kid because he's such a talented young guy and it was exciting to watch him, but you just never know what's going to happen. Uh, with that and what's going down with with that mo tell everybody what you got going uh the rest of this week and weekend uh up on bleacher report up on sports not and of course make sure everybody knows how to find your bleacher report live up on sports not i got five trade targets for the raiders focusing on defensive linemen edge rushes defensive tackles who can help max crosby get to the quarterback I won't be on Bleacher Report Live until after the Raider game on Sunday against the Patriots. So regardless of what happens, I'll break it all down with anyone who's on the live app in the chat box. We'll talk about it. Hopefully the Raiders can score over 18 points and we can have some more positive in the chat <laughs> because it. Yeah, I'm telling you, Scott, it was you would think the Raiders lost the game the way oh, people I know. reacted to that Packers uh, win on Monday Night Football. Yeah. And, and let me ask you this question, a wild card question. And it's hard to tell what they're doing because... The Los Angeles Rams, as far as I can re remember, even going back to the old days before you were even born, Mo, they would they did a lot of buying of good teams. They would go out and spend the money, try to make a run at it, and then be bad for a few years and then do it again. They weren't a big build through the draft franchise ever, even under the other ownership with the Frontier, Georgia Frontier. Now with Stan Kroenke, who's got more money than everybody except Elon Musk, perhaps, um, <laughs> They're in a position, they're performing a little better, but they could very easily find themselves by the trade deadline in a situation where it's looking grim. Is Aaron Donald a guy that could be moved this year? I think he is. I'm not I remember saying he would go to the Raiders, but if I'm the Raiders, I yeah. yeah. I remember this past offseason where the trade room was around Aaron Donald popped up. And I would say, as a GM, your job is to make all those calls, whether you think you're going to get a, a no or not. Right. Even if you know you're going to get a no, you ask anyway, because then you find out what the market is, because then things change, things happen. Maybe six months later, three months later, you call them back and they're open to a trade deal. But man, Aaron Donald in the middle of that greatest offensive line <laughs> with Max Crosby on the outside, man, that would be that would be a dream come true right there. But I would say Aaron Donald probably not on the market because the Rams, while their record is two and three, they're very competitive and they have yeah. a very good wide receiver duo with Cooper Cup and Puku Nakua and Matt Stafford maybe on the back end of his career. But as long as he stays upright, I believe the Rams have a chance in the NFC. They do no, and the quarterback play from Stafford still doing still doing well. I mean they're 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 performing higher than. But I will also say, and I said this on our Sports Not NFL Playbook podcast uh, that ran earlier today as well that um, my the Seattle Seahawks, I told you they would do well. Now, the 49ers, they're not going to catch the 49ers. I don't think that happens. But in the NFC, from a wild card perspective, watch the Seattle Seahawks. We'll see how they do uh, this weekend and how they do uh, moving forward. But but pretty good team. Pretty good team there. Uh, all right, Mo. Well, that's going to do it for our Thursday show. There you go. Mo picks Raiders 20 to 16. I said 24 to 10. 24 to 10. They're going to hold. The defense is going to have a nice day. You're going to see Zappy yeah, by the I second you half. Did. You see Zappy <laughs> by the second half. Mac Jones. Mo is no longer the president of the Mac Jones fan club. Right? You know what the funny thing is? I still think Mac Jones could be a decent quarterback simply because we saw it his rookie year. Mm -hmm. He could be a decent quarterback. And lo and behold, he was a decent quarterback under Josh McDaniels, nonetheless. So for the people <laughs> criticizing Josh McDaniels, Mac Jones has never looked any better after McDaniels left Can, New England. So I Maybe think they could the trade part. before the game. Garoppolo straight I up would, and just... It's it's scary because, and I'll, and I'll give some context, 
you know, you look at the interceptions, and I understand not all interceptions are on the quarterback. If you look at some of Mac Jones' interceptions, and this is not an excuse for Mac Jones, but some of those interceptions are off the receiver's hands. Like, there's nothing oh, you yeah. can do about it. Like, he yeah. was on target, but the receiver just couldn't pull it in. Just like Lamar Jackson last Sunday. Lamar Jackson, his box store stats look terrible. Right. But if you watched the game, you would have saw, like, his receivers were all dropping passes. And that's why I've never under, now we're going down a little rabbit hole here, but I'm going to go down it because I think that the listeners will enjoy it. And that is, everybody knows I'm a big baseball guy. When you're a pitcher in baseball and you throw a ball, guy hits the ball and your shortstop fumbles it and it's an error, it doesn't count. If that guy scores, now I know baseball is a little different. If that runner scores, it doesn't count against your earned run average. So it doesn't. It doesn't hurt your quote unquote stats. You you're not statistically blamed for it. Okay. The 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 player in the field is, which is accurate. So what you just brought up, that's why the NFL, and I don't I, for the life of me, I gotta get somebody to figure tell me about it. I don't know why the NFL doesn't do that. Because if I throw a ball and it's right in your hands, Mo, and, and it goes right through your hands because of your lack of grip or whatever the hell your problem is and somebody intercepts the ball, why is that an interception against the, the quarterback? It should be counted differently. I just don't get it. I agree, and I think eventually you'll start to see that as analytics advances. I, I'm not, again, oh, I'm not an point. analytics, I'm not an analytics nerd, but I could see the advances coming because we already start to see that with Pro Football Focus with sacks. So if you have a Pro Football Focus account, anyone who has a Pro Football Focus account, you'll see that not all sacks count against offensive linemen. Sometimes you'll see a quarterback is charged with the sack because he yes. held the ball too long. Right. And that's the same. It's the same thing with an interception in the reverse, where it's not always the throwers' fault. Sometimes it's the receiver's fault. So just like in sacks, it's not always the offensive lineman's fault. Sometimes it's the quarterback's fault. Good point. Maybe I'll call the guys over at PFF. I know they're a polarizing and look, there's stats from everywhere. Some people trust stats from one organization, not from another, whatever. But but a good, interesting conversation. All right. There you go. Make sure you follow Mo again on X.com, Mo Moton, M-O-E-M-O-T-O-N. Also, I will have, uh, I have my Jimmy Garoppolo piece. If you missed it yesterday, go check that out up on sportsnot.com. Also have uh, the post-game reaction to the Raiders game this week. And, um, of course, we will have another live show after the game and then our normal slew of shows, including our mailbag show, which, by the way, was fun yesterday with all the voicemails. It's good to hear from your your voices and got some more messages today already. I would say you can send your, you can leave your voicemail, your email anytime. But I would say yeah. after the game would be great. I would love to hear, maybe this week, not so much, but I would love to hear some of those uh, after the game because we have until Wednesday. So as long as you get your call to us by late Tuesday, you'll, you'll make the show. So make sure you uh, do that. So we appreciate it and have fun with that. All right, Mo, I will talk to you again uh, on uh, Tuesday. 2016, take it to the bank. There you go. Mostradamus speaks. For our producer, Mike Robier from Odyssey, I am uh, Scott Branson, and we will talk to you guys after the game on Sunday. Enjoy the rest of your week, and have a great weekend.